Welcome back to a, another edition of Pod by the Bay, brought to you by the Bay Area Examiner. I am Seth Varnador. I'm joined by Anthony Vito. Look at that beautiful shirt if you're watching the video. And Robert Stieg, who also has a beautiful shirt, a beautiful sweatshirt. It's beautiful. It's, I, I've been wearing the other one for the past three days, and I finally <laughs> needed to wash it. I, I let my I let my kid pick out my shirt, and this is the one he picked. So, I mean, he's got Smart a good kid. eye. He's got a good eye. So, if you haven't seen Vito show, I'll show mine. We've got uh, stickers somewhere in the back here too. Yeah, they're very small, but they're back here. Little hat mock up over here, you know. These but, are also very comfy t shirts. Uh, they're very. They turn out the pod by, by Bay Area Examiner said just as comfy as Home Field Apparel. Yeah, they turned out great, Vito spearheaded this effort and did an awesome job so applause all around for veto Crushed hopefully it. it was worth the wait <laughs> yeah <laughs> which was so, also you know my doing yeah well, i mean i blame christmas but that's all right so we are going we're not live but we're recording we're live to tape here uh we are recording right after usf goes on the road and beats east carolina 71 to 60 in men's basketball uh pretty big win for your South Florida Bulls there, Steve. Yeah, it was it was a pretty good win, I'd say. Um, I mean the metrics won't won't love it um for a stupid reason. Uh EC went on a six nothing run over the last minute to make this a little bit closer. Uh this is a uh, ECU was a quad three opponent, so you typically want to beat those teams by like 50. So it kind of a crummy way because like their net ranking and their Ken Palm probably won't go up too much, but man, they, they dominated wire to wire uh, the entire way through. I, I, I don't think that there was any doubt, you know, and I'll check ESPN, you know, a little ticker thing, but I think from the tip, they controlled this game handedly for 40 minutes. And that is shocking. Well, they jumped out to a, a, a eleven nothing start before ECU got their first bucket. They were zero for their first eight. The Pirates. So uh, uh, even from the jump, uh, USF was hitting the th- hitting three pointers like they did against UTSA, which we'll get to in a second. Breaking records every game, but um, yeah, I mean it ended up seventy one sixty. ECU went on a run there. They did get it within six with uh, probably five minutes left to go, and then they went out to their own ten zero run to kind of put it away. But that puts them at 14 and 5, 7 and 1 in the conference. Um, and right now, only a half game out of first uh, behind Charlotte and FAU. So, um, did, did anybody have that on their bingo card this year? Probably not. Uh, yeah. It's uh, so just I, I pulled up for everyone that's watching the video the uh, the squiggly win probability thing Steve was just referencing. Oh. Um, USF, we, we I don't know if we mentioned it yet, got out to an 11 nothing lead in this game. Uh, came out the box hot. And this was one that, you were a little worried about just because they've had such a good run of play. There's always seems to be a clunker in college basketball somewhere, and especially on the road. But you come out hot and start uh, the game with an 11-0 lead. That win probability went up to 77.4%, and that's like four minutes into the game. So it, it steadily kind of rose. It dipped a little bit. I thought there was some times in the second half where – you know, it looked like he was getting tired. You're like, oh man, you know, is was it just the three point shooting, the hot three point shooting at the start that kind of is keeping this game where it is? Uh, but they were able to kind of just stretch it right back out. So really awesome performance. I don't think there's anything else you could want to see from this team at this point. Um, right, and, and they did it in an ugly way, uh, in in a way. I mean, the three point shooting was fantastic. Uh, Ten for twenty five on the night, about forty percent. Um, so fantastic to see, you know, 27, uh, 53 from the field. Great shooting there. Uh, not great free throws, uh, seven, 13, uh, just wasn't consistent at the line. Uh, also 17 turnovers. And, uh, that's also pretty rebounding. There was uh, negligible. It was 36 to 32 USF in favor. Um, but I mean, they, for all intents and purposes, this is, this is the ugly game statistics wise. Like if you didn't pay attention to the game at all, you would think that, you know, this was just an ugly game by UF and they were able to, you know, pull away late there. But no, this was just, you know, USF got out to a quick lead, held that lead the entire way through, letting it crack in here and there, and then just matched it with 
an even greater run than what ECU was able to put forward. Um, I think ECU went on a couple of six nothing seven run. USF went on multiple ten plus nothing runs to just to deflate the balloon uh, pathetic in, in the ECU uh, building there. Yeah, I think ECU cut it to five at one point and then just stretched it right back out. So that's a that's a killer. I think, especially you think you you got one shot to kind of cut it close. Just to what you were talking about, Steve, in terms of the free throws, um, only seven, only seven made, only so about ten percent of points came off free throws tonight for the season. That's closer to twenty two percent. I think Ken Palm's got at twenty one point seven percent of points come from free throws. So to see a night where you're not quite as good and not getting to the line as much, still able to kind of hit that 70 point mark, which they seem to, seem to keep hitting and uh, pull away on the road. That's an awesome thing to see. Right. Yeah. Every time there was a run and um, I think a lot of people are still thinking about um, errors in, in the past where a, a team will come, come out to get the regain the momentum. And then you kind of see them deflate and possibly lose the game. There always seemed to be a big shot or a big either coming out of a timeout or a big play that just kind of silenced the crowd a little bit to kind of get it back. I mean, you had three guys in double figures. Uh, Young Blood put up twenty on seven eleven field goals, four of seven from three point land, which is which is great. Uh, and Pryor had another double double, fourteen and eleven, and then uh, Selton Miguel off the bench had fourteen points as well. There are multiple times where one of those guys, or Kobe Knox, or Stroud even, would come out and stop our ECU run by making a really great play. Um, and it it just really good and kind of shows you what. Uh, Coach Amir is doing, especially on the sideline, you never see him get angry. You never see him yell. Does he even sweat? I don't even know. He always looks <laughs> calm and collected, like, hey, we just need to weather this and stop it. And then they get back to playing good defense. Um, the one thing that really is uh, is interesting about this team is you don't see them making a lot of stupid turnovers. This game, they th there was a lot of those, but they were able to weather the storm and still win. So as we say, win your clunkers. If your clunker is still winning by 11 on the road um, on, on a midweek yeah. game, that's incredible. Like this is like you know, tw uh, a year ago they lost to ECU in the first round of the AAC uh, tournament, conference tournament, and Brian Gregory gets fired uh, a day later. So it's like this is a, this is how different this team is now. Yeah, I, I think that's a great way. Like this was a clunker because this is a team that had been great. One of their biggest strengths is they don't turn the ball over, and then another one of their biggest strengths is they've been really good at free throw shooting this year and and not getting the line a ton in this game and not making a ton. And then, like you said, Vito, turning it over. This says, like, if you just said that before the game, you know, you may have thought, okay, well, this is this definitely on the road. This is the one that's going to slip away from them. Um, but, no, man, they, they played – they shot the lights out and then were able to respond. So just looking um, – interesting kind of just to look uh, on the stat broadcast stuff – like Stieg mentioned, the game was not even as close as the 11 points. ECU ended on a 6-0 run in the last minute and a half when the game was in hand. Uh, but I thought it was interesting. USF, you were talking about like closing out strong. They made eight of their last 10 field goals. Yep. So, like, when once when it came down to it, they were able to produce in kind of those clutch moments and keep that uh, margin up high. So, awesome job against – ECU also had uh, some other games this week since we last recorded. Um, I will, uh, before we go into that game, uh, one other thing. My favorite moment this entire night, and if you're not in the Discord, we have uh, a live game thread. And I don't know at what point in this game is, I don't recall, but at 8.30, uh, Justin714 goes, it's just not Case and Pryor's night. Uh, at that point, he had like three points and like nine rebounds. Um you know, wasn't doing too well. Immediately, Kaysen rattled off like eight points to mm -hmm. bring himself to a double double. Um, like within like a minute after that, hit like two threes and then, uh, you know, bounce back into that. So another double double by him, just incredible. But yes, now we can go back to. And um, I don't think he was, and I don't think he was totally wrong, right? No, like the first I, half, I'll actually piggyback off that listening to early in the broadcast. Um, th they tried to put, uh, cause they have some size. So they tried to really, um, hit, hit up on prior in the paint and they did, they did a really good job. Here's the problem. Then guys like young blood 
and uh, some of the other sharpshooters were now hitting three pointers pretty much uncontested. So they actually went to a smaller lineup to try to stop that, in which case then Pryor would take over. So like that's the beauty about this team is they have multiple guys who can score on any given night and they'll give it to whoever the hot hand is. And if they try to compensate on defense, they'll go ahead and beat you the other direction. So that, I thought that was kind of interesting. The minute that they tried to go smaller, or stop Youngblood um, or Miguel, then boom. Prior, <laughs> then you got to watch out for him. And then Kobe Knox in an awesome dunk uh, late in the first half that was just like rattled the whole gym. It was incredible. Yeah, they got they got some guys that can play, and that's always helpful. But I, like I think we're pretty uh, thumbs up so far on the hire of AAR. It's a uh, it's fun to um, be talking some exciting basketball. It's been kind of a slog. Uh, since I since I joined, I don't know. I may just be bad luck, and maybe we finally gotten over it. But uh, <laughs> since I, since I've come on, basketball's been rough, football had been, but this year uh, seems to be washing it all away. So that's great. Anything else on this game tonight? Before we get to some of the other games, real quick. Uh, I I think we pretty much hit it. Um, ECU's pirate script looked really really good, but you know what? Num- they're trying to be the Lake. They're trying to be the Lakers, right? With those numbers, like the, the, so. the drop shadow or whatever. Yeah. I was just, yeah, it, it just something's a little off there. It doesn't come I, together quite. I will, I will say, if you're not in the Discord, join because every time we talk about the game prior, um, about like, oh, you know, is this the game? We start looking at some advanced stats. We go, oh, they're really, really good at rebounding. USF's not, and everything, every, every game, uh, Coach Amir has been able to prove uh, prove the haters wrong, if you will. Every um, time they did I come in as a dog, plus living. two and a half. So it's funny Every seeing time. us go like, oh, this might be the one. This might be the one. This might, and they, they just keep rolling. Seven and one conference right now. And let's talk about. We'll go back. We we recorded last week before they played Temple, um, and that was one where the shot quality. Temple was a team that was really good in the shot quality stats but their shooting percentages were terrible. So, you know, our fear was that you go on the road and, you know, you get some uh, positive regression for Temple and, you know, they shoot you out of the gym. Well, they tried. I mean, <laughs> they they uh, they shot 44% from three, which I think they were in the 20s for the season or the low 30s. Uh, so they shot out of their mind from three, but uh, USF was able to kind of match that and shoot 45 45- 0.5% themselves and 50% from the field overall. So they kind of withstood the barrage and uh, came back and finished that one really strong too. That was a uh, another tight game to the wire there. And Case and Pryor had 20 points. And uh, he's been really great from the free throw line, which is really steadying. But um, Steve, it was kind of <laughs> that, that game started and it was like, oh my Lord, this is everything we talked about. Uh, I, unfortunately, I was big clinch. Like there, there was clinch for like the first half, and I was like, "This is it, like USF for whatever reason doesn't matter what regime, doesn't matter what era. It, like at Temple is just a nightmare. Whatever sport it is, it does not matter." And uh, yeah, I uh, I didn't like how it started. I loved how it ended though. Um, felt great about it, and it was uh, it was a good time. I actually look back because I was like, God, what happened in that game? Because every time one of these games happen, I'm like, this is fantastic. Memory dump. How are we going to lose the next one? <laughs> and so it's just, it's maddening. But um, and I, I, I hate that I'm this way, but, you know, we all we all have our vices and my in virtues. Yeah, so interesting. Looking back through that game, just the same kind of win probability thing uh, we looked at on ESPN uh, for that game, USF. Uh, when it was tied two to two, uh, USF had a fifty-one point seven percent win probability. They didn't have an over fifty percent win probability again until four twenty-eight left in the second half. So that was a game they had to fight through, and they're able to make that kind of comeback. And I just were able to finish it on the road. This team's got some toughness to it. Yeah, they do. Um, I think my favorite part about it was uh, listening to Coach Amir's post-game press conference um, after the game. He he made a few interesting comments. First one was you know, that he, he wasn't happy. You know, th- he thought it was great that they won. You know, he made sure to mention, you know, the job's not finished. He's happy with things. And he recognized the things that they needed to work on, but didn't make a mention of it. Just said, I know what we need to work on. We're going to work on it. Um 
and, and just they continue to preach this unselfish basketball that is paying its dividends right now for for his team. So um, yeah, his post game press conferences are very interesting. He's very candid, but almost like there's a bug in his ear saying, "No, no, no, don't don't say what you're about to say next," because he'll he'll cut himself off and be like, "Oh wait, no, I I might be giving away too many secrets if I mention mention this part of it." All right, well, let's get to uh, Vito. Do you have something to say on Temple, or do you want to talk about the game that's kind of the the more really fun game? Well, I'll I'll just pivot to to just kind of the stats that you mentioned. They were hitting uh, Temple was fifty percent from three and forty four percent from the field in the first half, and USF shot thirty four percent from three and field goal range. What kept a minute was free throws. They're eleven for twelve, so they were down by five in that first half. And in the second half, pretty much everything shifted. They shot sixty five percent from the field in the second half, and then sixty percent from three to Temple's thirty one and forty. So it was one of those things where I always look at this and go. Right now, USF's a very good second half team, and I don't know if they they make those adjustments and figure out what to do or get the right players in the right position, or you know, something Miguel comes off the bench and they just keep him on the field on the court the rest of the game, and he uh, you know puts up sixteen. But it's just the flip there was they're they're will they're able to kind of break the any t- type of barrage, even if it's consistent across the first half, they're able to figure that in the second half and then come back with an answer on their own. And that's just, again, just grit and just kind of knowledge of uh, the game plan and figuring out what plays work and putting the right guys in the right positions, which is just something we haven't seen recently. So every game kind of has its own story, but they always seem to figure out a way, which I mean, goes to coaching and goes to, yeah. you know, obviously talent and play uh, coaching up that talent. And what makes you excited is it's not the same way every time, right? It's it's like you said, they find whatever way they got to do it. You said against ECU, they had to go a little more. They went a little smaller lineup uh, or ECU didn't. They just punished them that way. It's fun to see a team with answers, and that's from the coaches too and the players. So, uh, Vito, how about that UTSA game? That was amazing. <laughs> I mean, that was <laughs> – it- it, you just love a game where it's like, oh, uh, record breaking. But I mean, that was another one where, the, you know, they come back and is you know, UTSA can be scrappy, but boy, howdy! I mean, I don't understand how you can go, um, uh, what eighteen for thirty three from three point range, fifty. You know, you're shooting fifty percent. Eighteen is the most three pointers in the in uh, in a game, so that that broke a record. UTSA, who was really good from range, started off a little shaky, but got there. Still scored 10 three-pointers. And you would think if you do that on the road, you have a pretty good shot. You know, you're within striking distance. And, you know, you lose 89 to 72. Like, that's how good they were shooting. The foam dome was exploding. Yeah. USF had a 99% win probability with over 15 minutes left in the second half. So I'd love to see it. <laughs> in case you're wondering about the hot start. One thing that I, th- I think is... um. It's, I think it's probably mostly players, but the coach obviously brings in the players. Looking back to the last few years, uh, three-point shooting percentage, because we've seen these last three games, uh, they've shot pretty well from three, and that could be a run of good shooting. But for the season, they're shooting 34.9% from three, according to Ken Palm, which is 123rd in the country. You go back to last year, it was 33.6, which is 194th. You go back two seasons, they shot 25.2% from three. Which was three hundred and fifty-eight. That was bad. Uh, yeah. We remember that year. That was bad. <laughs> and the year prior, they were two hundred thirty-first with thirty-two point four percent from three. So, in modern basketball, if you're shooting twenty-five percent, you're not going to win a lot of games. Which uh, newsflash: they did not win a lot of games that year. So, <laughs> but to see this team be able to do that and kind of have have that in the bag and obviously set a record doing it is a uh, really fun to see. It makes the games a lot more fun to watch too. Who would have thought that uh, just being good at shooting threes makes your team better. <laughs> Who would have thought <laughs> shooting mattered in basketball so much? Infantes- like right. j- j- just barely enough. And then boom, there you go. Or free throws. I mean, <laughs> how many times in the past couple of years, I didn't, didn't like Lauren pickle and a bunch of people say, Oh, you know, we'll donate X amount of dollars for every percentage point over how 50% in free throw shooting. Cause it was that, rough and they would lose games based on that and now all of a sudden they're shooting you know relatively well and then they're winning games this year 74 percent from the line which is 84th in the country that's really Uh, good last year 65 last year last year 65.1 percent which was 343rd oh and (laughs) And that was a jump 
The year before, it was 334th at 63.2. And the year before, I want to keep this all live at 327. I want to keep this all in perspective of like, man, like they they started out rough too. Like, I, I wish you could just take off the first five games of the year. Cause like, yeah, they had good games, they had bad games. And everything. like, I, I almost want to just like rip it up and look at it just in like conference play, but I also want to include the Florida State win too. But like oh, yeah. they like yeah they I I mean again patience is a virtue. Do you know they, their record since UMass? They're like fourteen 13 and one. Fifteen. Yeah, they've yeah. They, outside of that stupid uh, UAB game where they UAB shot forty one free throws. Like I, you know, I just start looking at the other games and go like, okay, it's like twenty eighteen. How the heck did they score? Uh, shoot forty one free throws and they were still with it anyway. That game was upsetting. Uh, Molly and I were watching it on my phone in Key West, and we we're like, "Really? More free throws coming? All right." Oh, yeah. UAB has just been killing them this year on the road. Um, but yeah, just like looking at those little things, and uh, Steeg brought up, and again, I keep I keep harping the Discord. But what I love about it is it's our community where we can just kind of chat. Where it's like Twitter, you can't really do that. Message board, you have to log. You know, it's a whole thing. Discord's yeah. nice because we can just kind of like put thoughts out there. But Steeg made a good point. And that opening. Um, at a conference slate because they didn't do many like those many preseason tournaments they would play like a game and then it would be seven days to the next game 10 games to the next game so it's like when you have a whole team that is brand new trying to play each other in gel and you don't get those types of matchups coming up clo- uh, close uh, close enough to be able to kind of get anything and half the time like that cmu game usf was playing their second game and cmu was playing their fifth or something it was wild it's like, well, yeah. yeah, you can't gel. You can't really get anything going. So once they finally got that, took the break, I think they finally figured out putting the, the, the players in the right um, right places to succeed and figuring out what worked at that point. But it, right. It, you're right. That early season just killed them. I mean, I mean those losses to Maine, I mean, Hofstra's good, but, you know, th- those are going to kill you. And as people start talking about, I mean, I don't want to say it, but talk about postseason – that unfortunately is going to hurt you, and there's not really opportunities to, uh, you know, raise that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if I, I'm sure if they could do it back, you know, they as many you know scrimmages and and live game ball and everything like that. But yeah, that that early slate of uh, Central Michigan was coming off like their th- third straight. Like that was going into that game was their third game in seven days, mm-hmm. and USF was on their second game in seven days and so like yeah of course the team's going to be a little one team's going to be coming in hot the other team's going to be coming in cold just i mean usf was coming off of one win central machine again was coming off of three losses like yeah there's going to be you know some some repair some fix there but yeah i mean the the, the gelling of the team is is what is extremely nice to see and i i, I don't think he's getting enough credit dated to read for a true freshman is really coming into his own these last couple of games. He'll still make freshman mistakes here and there, but I mean, he is, he's standing tall against, you know, COVID seniors and, and guys that are five years older than him. And, you know, he he's a bright spot for this team going forward in the future. You know, they, there's a reason why that kid's starting as, as often as he is. He is electric when he gets the ball. He's, he's confident and Chris Youngblood is mentoring him and you can see, just phases of, of Jaden Reed's game mimicking what Chris Youngblood is doing on the floor. So get both of those guys back next year is, is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, Jaden Reed, 109th in the country in the assist rate. So pretty Ooh. good job distributing. Uh, also, Case and Pryor, 78th in the country in defense rebound rate and 82nd in fouls drawn per 40 minutes. So if you're a good free throw shooter and you can draw fouls, that is – very helpful to your team. Now, uh, men's basketball has obviously exceeded expectations. Let's turn it to maybe a basketball team that, um, through not necessarily any fault of their own, maybe a little bit, but some bad luck has kind of uh, underwhelmed a little bit in terms of their preseason expectations. Let's switch to women's basketball. Fellas, what's the temperature of uh, the women's basketball team right now? They really it's, needed that win last week against ECU. Yeah. They really needed that win. And the way that they won too, I think that might help because it, and it just really stinks because as a transition year, um, I don't think we all knew exactly how much Sammy was going to mean to this team from a shooting standpoint, but I think you needed her sharp shooting to help bridge this gap. Um, but you're just playing a lot of young, a, a lot of young guys. And it's, 
it's tough. And this conference is not, I mean, it, it's, it's not like bringing those other, uh, the, the, the new CUSA programs and they're not nothing to, you know, sh- shake a fist at. That's not really the right term I'm looking for. They're good <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So it's not like you replaced who you left with anyone, um, who should be easier. So, uh, it's been a tough go. I know, uh, Stieg's been a little more into it and has uh, a little more intel, but that game, like watching that game, they finally looked like they were playing and looking like they were having fun, which was missing in previous, uh, in their, in their previous losses. Yeah. And, and this team really just needs confidence more than anything. And and that's the shame about it is that like they, they start getting that confidence back the closer that Sammy was coming back. The more she was practicing, the more she was participating, you could kind of see it. And in that game, uh, she played, like, you could see the team kind of elevate. Everyone was smiling. Everyone was laughing. Everyone was having fun. And then the injury happened. And then they went on that road trip to through Texas and got their asses kicked, man. Like, no no mm-hmm. skin off my back. You know, I'm sure Jose would probably say the same thing. They got their asses kicked. There was no confidence in that team. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't string together cohesive possessions. And that's something we haven't seen from USF women's basketball in a long time. You know, you have a potent scorer with uh, Victoria Blasig, but other than that, you don't really have a perimeter threat like you would with Sammy. You don't have someone that can just drop 20 on a dime and just not have to worry about it. And so Vicky's had to take an elevated role, and they're getting a lot more work out of Romy Levy than they were probably expecting. Um, Romy Levy is, is not replacing what Olsi was in that team as far as rebounds and as far as effort. But her ability to to get points and get to the rim is what they are going to be what they were missing in that stretch. They needed someone under the basket that they could give the ball to, that they could consistently get scoring out of. And and that UTS or the excuse me the ECU game, you know, Romans for twenty one points, uh, ten rebounds for a double double. You know, she's or excuse me, uh, twenty one point seven rebounds. Um, you know, in forty minutes of action, the entire game didn't come out. And unfortunately, that's what they're going to have to be doing to get some semblance of the season back under control. Um, it's, it's a tough stretch for them, but you know, they, they've got enough power and confidence under their belt after this win that I think they can build off of it, but the Vicky, they need Maria Alvarez. Um, they need Marina Asensio. They need scoring outside of Vicky and Romy going forward. Someone has to get, uh, and I'll just say eight points. That's, that's yeah. all I would ask. <laughs> mm-hmm. So last, and they didn't last even year, shoot. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Vito. Oh, no, I, I was just going to piggyback off. They didn't even shoot particularly well against ECU. Still, only twenty five percent from uh, from three, which you know, a, a Jose coach team is kind of unheard of. Only thirty five percent from the field, but they are de- de- defensively they're able to really uh, keep ECU off the score sheet. Even though um, they outscored them fifteen to nine in the first quarter, um, they really uh, put down the clamps in the second half. ECU only scored a. I had to do math in my head. 14 points in the second half. So um that that totally uh helps defensively. If you can't if you can't win by um um uh, by shooting the ball, then at least win by stopping the other team from shooting the ball, which definitely helps. But uh the the, the positive thing here is you're getting a lot of a lot of these young guys um uh reps right now, which hopefully will pay dividends later. But I mean, it would be really, really uh great if Jose can figure out a way to kind of keep uh keep this um uh, the season interesting uh, going forward. Yeah, though it's interesting, kind of just looking at, um, like you kind of talked about the the woes are it's kind of in that scoring. If you look at the defense, um, so if you look at kind of per one hundred possessions on defense, this uh, last year they were 89th in the country, allowing eighty seven point three points per one hundred possessions. This year they're one hundred and thirty first, but they're allowing eighty seven point four. So it's not much different than last year. Uh, but last year they were 45th in the country on offense, scoring 102 points per 100 possessions. This year they are 156 on offense, scoring 93.9 points per 100 possessions. So almost a 10 point drop or a nine point drop there. Um, offensively, the defense is about the same, and that's why uh, it's not quite the results have not been quite the same this season. So, right, just. Imagine what this team would be like if they had an extra 15 points per game. That's that's mm-hmm. that was Sammy's scoring average. That's what this team could be this year, could have been this year, and just the unfortunate nature that you lost 
a first team all conference potential player of the year. Yeah, she one played game. one game and scored twenty one points. Yeah, you know, it would have been it would have been nice that. And yeah, then they, that then everybody else yeah. gets a lesser defender too. Like it, it kind of the effect is cascading as well. So right. Really tough there. They're trying to figure it out. It seems like they figured some stuff out, but it's just tough. So um, they get Memphis to- tomorrow on the road. So uh, we'll see if they can kind of continue that out. And then Saturday they travel to UAB um, for them for their first game against them. So cu- a couple of road games again. So we'll see what how they can do. Do we want to talk about uh, throwing the inbounds off of a defender for a lay-in? Cool as hell. It, it, dumbest it best that. play I've ever seen. <laughs> Just I've got a shouldn't have worked. Did I've got a fun story about that? So uh, Go for it. I was my dad and I were at an NIT game <laughs> a long time ago, <laughs> and um, there we got tickets right behind the basket because nobody really wanted to go. So a team's inbounding it. We start screaming, "Throw it off his back! Throw it off his back!" Because the guy his back, the defender has back turned, so the guy does it. And as we've been yelling that, the defender turns around and it just catches it right in his chest. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, we sat down or just, you know, got quiet. But uh, that's, what like, I think of, that's what I think of every time I see somebody do that. So that's fun. All right. Vito, I wanted to go rapid fire through the rest because we're not, it's not just basketball going on right now. We've got a lot of things going on on campus. So we don't want to go through rapid fire. So Vito, I'll turn it over to you and let you take the lead here. So uh, we want to talk about Stieg's favorite team this season, men's tennis. Yes, we can. We can talk about that. Um, I'll oh, sorry. Uh, so okay. start of the year against Florida Southern. Sorry, uh, started the year with Florida Southern. Uh, won six one there against uh, former USF assistant coach uh, who's now leading the Moxons there. So good little start there, and then they got kicked to the ITA kickoff tournament, which uh, is essentially a, a What's the nice way it says a death sentence for uh, a mid-major program? Uh, usually, it consists of uh, a four-team bracket, and the lowest seed will play the top seed, and you the top is hosting, and the top seed is usually a national seed, and so on and so forth. So, of course, USF uh, draws Georgia, who is top five in the country, and uh, lose pretty handily there for nothing. And then I uh, turned right around and beat a nationally ranked uh, Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Washington four um, one to to kind of bring them to a respectable two and one to start the year, which doesn't mean jack squat. So uh, good start for Ashley Fisher's program, though. Um, Alvin Tudorica and uh, Eric Gravelius are going to be your two leaders of the clubhouse uh, this year for men's tennis, but we'll see what they can uh, put together this year. Do I see that their doubles rank is ninth in the nation? It is indeed ninth in that the is nation. That is good. Not ninetieth, ninth. Um, yeah, they they're they're studs. And Ash Fisher also brought in a top twenty five recruiting class uh, according to ITA. So that's again fantastic as well. They brought in like the one JUCO player in the country, uh, a guy that was competing in in a bunch of tournaments in Italy and winning a whole lot of them too, and a few other um, key players as well. So those guys aren't going to be eligible until the fall, of course. But yeah, that momentum is is going to swing into their favor this year. Just, uh, just, uh, just a quick um, I- intro there. They actually lost to Tennessee. To oh, Jordan. sorry. But SEC yes. East can SEC East, and Tennessee has recruiting violations, which has nothing to do with tennis. But I just feel like I should say it. Um, right. But yes, you're they, truly so back. This, Tennessee football is truly back. This is amazing. Okay, hell yeah. pop for recruiting violations. But two and one, it was good. It's good to you know, st- and against Washington, they will play on Friday against Charlotte, a doubleheader, also with Stetson, and then they'll um, go to Coral Gables to play Miami on Sunday. Um, so that'll be fun and exciting as ten- as tennis kicks off. They end up having very weird schedules until we get to conference play. Um, so it's going in- to be interesting to see that. Um, Alvin Tudorico is also ranked number 27th as a singles player. So it'll be great to see what he does as, pro- as he progresses. Is he a senior finally? God, he might. He should be. Yes. I, okay. I just I can't remember. <laughs> These guys have so much COVID year and weird stuff with how the tennis years ended up uh during 2020 so 
They'll stay until I, they're gone. What exactly? Until they say you're not allowed to be here anymore, and then you could probably somehow uh, get uh, extra if you want, and then nil uh, x y z. Um, I'd like to see a tennis match. Doubles is always super fun to me to watch. Singles looks hard, and then it makes me go, hmm. I'll stick to pickleball. Yes, exactly. And um, then uh, are- switching gears, women's tennis uh, started the year with a victory over Florida Gulf. Uh, I believe that was a six one or seven nothing victory, uh, and then again ITA regional, and again got their asses handed to them uh, in a not so uh, efficient way. That was the Georgia mm-hmm. uh, that I saw in the calendar. There uh, lost four nothing to Georgia and lost um, four nothing to Arizona. So um, mm. again, nothing nothing of surprise. You know, this team kind of just needs time to kind of gel and they're playing top competition. There's, there's nothing else you can really say about it. Um, they'll be fine. They're, they've got enough talent on their squad this year. And I, I gave them crap for it two years ago and, and I'm, I'm paying my dividends out now to, uh, to pay respects to the USA tennis program. Yeah. A uh, uh, player to look out for is Grace Schumacher, uh, AAC all conference the last three seasons. Uh, so she is a senior this year. Uh, and also one of their better and doubles as well. And uh, I think the only other thing is track. Uh, yep. They're doing well. Yep. Six uh, first place season. finishes. Yep. Yeah. Go on. At the PNC Lenny Lyles Invitational. Stuff. Um, A lot of them were track. running. Yeah. That, <laughs> and I, I'm excited to see if the field uh, team can start putting together some wins, especially on the women's side of things. Um, they've got a, a guy that can do shot put there that seems like she's – capable of putting up some dubs so uh and, and throw the rock really far which is a fun segment for uh, if you've never watched a uh, tracker field but yeah they uh they should be good early season track is by crap shoes it's all indoor and no one likes indoor track anyways so uh this will just mostly be hey how many wins can we get under our belt increase our u.s track and field collegiate uh ranking and then the outdoor season starts which is when all your uh, bread and butter is done so the track calendar for you first two months don't matter. And then all of a sudden for a month and a half, the, this team is just going to be on fire and they, they are going to be good this year. Yeah. I mean, I, I, coach Eric Jen- Jenkins has had this team really kicking up year after year. They got a national championship uh, uh, last year in the high jump. Uh, he transferred to Arkansas. Uh, I love how the results has the LLC that puts them out. DC timing LLC shout out PNC Lenny likes invitational to help small businesses out. Let's go. Um, uh, it's, it's increasingly hard even when you we were doing this last year to find the track results and what they actually mean. Cause a lot of times it's just like prelims 6.66 qualifying. What's the final? Oh, Got to go another sheet. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit harder to find that. Um, but, Six uh, event winners in track this week at the PNC L- Lenny Lyles Invitational. And then January 12th, also six event winners in the Jimmy Carnes Invitational. So that number, as they keep doing these year on year out, it keeps increasing as they bring in more talent into the program, which, uh, you know, eight years ago before him just was continuously at the bottom of the conference in most of these outside of a occasional uh, player here and there. So. Uh, they head to Harvard, the Harvard Crimson Elite. It's really funny how these are all like the same from last year, I'm remembering. Um, so that's in February. They head to Cambridge, which will be very nice and cold, I imagine. Um, and but- that's that's the big one for indoor. That is like where the sausage gets made. Uh, that's It's called the Harvard Crimson Elite Indoor for a reason. Like That is where you'll see the biggest names will be competing in that. So if USF can get a, a good couple of victories out of that, that'll be a really good sign for this upcoming season. Yeah, and they split squad uh, this weekend, the second and third. Some of the team will go to Gainesville for the Celebration Point Indoor Classic. And then on Saturday, those, I'm assuming, that were at Harvard will then um, go to Boston, which should still be cold, at the Bruce Lee Haynes Scarlet and White Invitational at BU, where, you know, I had family who went to BU, so there you go. Yeah, we're in, a, but, we're in that point of the composite calendar here where you'll see, like, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, like, 18 things happen. It's fun and it's like not these, miserable these players go over there. i wonder how many coaches like go like who goes where or does like coach jenkins like okay i'm gonna go to i'm gonna go to massachusetts or i'm gonna be in gainesville friday or you know massachusetts friday then book it back saturday and then 
It's a lot of he FaceTimes into all of them. He he's not he's no longer head coach. I've never talked about this. He's no longer the head coach for for track and field. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Okay. He's like he's like the the CEO of University of South Florida cross country track and like whatever. Like he he got a new title that I had never seen before. And I had a, I checked and like the only schools that do this are like the ones that are like super serious about it. He's the director of track and field and cross country for USF now. And now his associate head coaches take care of individual events and and things to compete for. So now things are kind of split and segmented between all the different uh, events, including cross country. Um, Cross country coach also does, um, you know, the the distance and the sprints and everything like that. So uh, really neat and weird thing. Interesting. Okay. Okay. There we go. But still he oversees as the director of track and field and cross country, which I think has a higher uh, retirement rate. No, I'm kidding. Um, right. But for money. Yeah, I mean, they have a lot is, more coaches now too. Is it not just head coach and name only or head coach by any other name arose by any other name? Head coach right. by any other name. I mean, <laughs> Because it's not like there's head coaches of these things. All these people are associate head coaches or assistant coaches. of. Like I imagine yeah, if you're really good at coaching people running, someone's really good at coaching people throwing big rocks, and someone else is really good at how you jump. I never really yeah. understood these, and I've always, like, when we were doing this, I was like, we need to get some of these fun, some of these uh, coaches on some of these programs in here to talk about it. Because, like, yeah, like, how do you coach someone to run better? I mean, like, it's nutrition, and I'm guessing, you know, Steeg, I know, I know you're a long-distance runner now. Or a mid mid oh. to long distance runner, but like, can you imagine like a coach in the air like, no, run slower now and then faster and then eat your Wheaties or I don't know. That's like the Gaffigan bit about being a bowling coach. <laughs> this time I want you to knock them all down. Are you sure, coach? <laughs> yes. Is that is that the play? Yes. <laughs> is that the play? Yeah. Like, um, I, honestly, what it comes down to more than anything is just having enough coaches available to help. <laughs> and, and we can we can save this for a uh, a ponderosa section of like how do you have a good track program a uh, high coach sounds more <laughs> different sounds than it is uh surprisingly but yeah they um I, i'll end it there steve you were particularly interested i i heard you kind of give plaudits to the assistant coach of throws um who is that did you <laughs> uh, good luck, <laughs> Miriami Kefeshefi Machavarani. Oh man, I'll throw it up on the screen so everyone can see. It's good, hell of a bio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually hell incredible bio. and an excellent Scrabble word. I guess they don't allow proper names, but when you can get a, an Olympian and NCAA shot or a champion, it's always a good thing. Yeah, I, I, it is interesting how they have the, how they have it staffed up, but boy, it's worked. Uh, <laughs> she's from name. Georgia, the country. Yes, <laughs> I mean I figure. <laughs> I didn't think she was from like uh, you know, she's from Albany, Buckhead or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, Beautiful. Romaine Beckford. I'm actually. I wonder if we should do a little segment about how he's doing in Arkansas because uh, again, national champion can't take. Can't take titles away. Well, Listen, both indoor I'll, and outdoor. He never he never lost. Before anyone comes for him talking about why did Romaine Beckford leave, uh, with USF, you can win national championships. With Arkansas going to go to the Olympics. Yep. And that's the difference. I this would be like uh, like if God God forbid this happens. If USF, if Byron Brown's you to go to Oregon, would not blame him. That's just that's just the nature of that program like you you've got the money you've got the support you've got eyeballs you've got everything you need at oregon and you got everything you need at arkansas he won national championships here thank you romaine beckford for everything you have for usf you will always be a bull to me uh go win uh olympic gold that would be dope as hell absolutely because again he still has that championship uh flag flying here and uh, i think he was unanimous fella of the year if i recall correctly Yes. Some say that's more important than the national championship. Some might say. Somehow we got through all of this in 45 minutes. <laughs> Look at that. What, what, how, did you uh, did you feel very informed, Seth? I looked over and you were like, yeah, 
Tennis. <laughs> <laughs> love a love a good tennis match. When is pickleball coming to college? Ooh, that's my college question. pickleball. That's got to be on man. its way. I have a feeling we're going to get into esports as like an official D one. Oh, my, an my association. Daughter, my daughter's school has pickleball. A pickleball team. She's in second grade. They've got like fifth graders that they're playing pickleball. It's coming. Well, they've got a hell of a got. They've got a hell of a lot of those tournaments now. I'm sure I'm sure it'll come soon. How are we not part of the U.S. Collegiate Pickleball Association? There's a lot of teams here, schools here, but not USF and or University of South Florida. Mm. Oh, well. Maybe Fire. soon. Fire we just don't have pickleball courts. Because if you have pickleball courts, you're using the tennis courts. So, you know, we got to have make sure the tennis courts is... Michael Kelly on the hot seat? <laughs> <laughs> summer say I, I I can't wait for USF men's basketball to lose for everyone to tweet at Michael Kelly again. You look, like, God damn it! <laughs> why why did you do this? He's uh, just he's just sitting back right now. Probably like a I just imagine a giant cigar in his mouth. He's just like, yeah, it's going pretty good. Pack watch. Yeah, doing pretty I, well. The way that that basketball like search happened as well um the fact that they landed on uh coach amir and he might have been the best of the choices is, is pretty great um time will tell but what, what, i mean what I, they needed in this in this year in this time with you know the way of realignment is going and the way that reshuffling of division one sports is going they needed those two sports to come out hot and um uh, they both have so far and i mean i'm hopefully they didn't just jinx basketball but like <laughs> Looking and, good. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more basketball on this week's edition of the Ponderosa. We're going to go record that now. If you want to get the Ponderosa, you join the $10 a month tier on Patreon. That is our most popular tier by far. We've got quite a few people in there. Um, that gives you access to everything in the $5 tier, which is the Discord, uh, the paid section of the Discord, where you can get recruiting information, coaching information, all kinds of stuff. And Anything we get that we're going to put out, we put it in there first. So we've been able to break some news in there. Uh, and then you, at the $10 level, you also get an extra podcast a week for a month, sometimes more. We had film rooms and stuff like that in our football. We're adding probably some more stuff, uh, I'm sure, during uh, as basketball and baseball get going here. And we kind of get you access to some numbers. Like we did some PFF stuff during football. Some Ken Palm stuff here during basketball. We'll have some baseball stuff as well. So uh, for 10 bucks a month, you get a lot. And then $25 a month, every, everybody is a $25 a month person. Got one of these bad boys sent to them and some uh, some stickers. Quarterly merch, baby. Got some of these Hell bad yeah. boys sent. And some other stuff. And there will be more on the way for those patrons and they all were also the first to know that byron brown was going to be starting and gary bohannon was probably out for the season a couple weeks before uh the season started so if that sounds interesting to you join up at patreon i think it's just patreon.com the bay area examiner or you could probably google the bay area examiner or look on our twitter page and we have no we have uh i think we have links for everything up there or join the discord and ask us in there we'll get you anything you want so there it is. Gentlemen, we're done this week. No, Nathan, no problem. I mean, we'll see. But uh, we got through all the major sports here. Vito gave us a nice roundup. There's nothing else to say but go Bulls. Go, go Bulls. Bulls.